Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb. Welcome, everyone, to Motor Week Podcast number 201. And we're coming to you from Studio C at Motor Week Central. Around our table today, we have lots of talent. Our writer, mm. producer, Brian Robinson. Hello, everybody. He had just a little quick there. That was pregnant pause. Online content co- coordinator, Greg Carlos. Yeah, that's me. Road test producer, Ben Davis. Hey, guys. Sorry I missed 200, but here I am. Yeah, for... you're back. We missed you, too. <laughs> and our video, our video producer and editor and the producer of these podcasts, Joe Ligo. I'll balance out the lots of talent with a lack of it. No, I don't think so, Joe. As we'll <laughs> soon find out with one of your muscle car memories, we have a ton of stuff to get through today. And we're going to start over on uh, my left, which you can't really see because this is radio. Brian Robinson, Compact SUV Challenge the uh, that you did once again with our friends up at Cars.com. Tell us about it. Yeah, it seems like we do this one just about every year now, but that is one of the biggest segments out there, Compact SUV, so uh, it is warranted to do that. Uh, a couple new entries uh, this time around. The Forester was all new. RAV4 was all new. Uh, I think that's it. Tiguan was all new, or was that around last year when they did? Tiguan I guess that was, was the, around last year. Tiguan was the winner last time, right? So when it was all new, um, so those three were going up against the Hyundai Tucson, Honda CRV, Jeep Cherokee, and Nissan Rogue, and uh, the Volkswagen Tiguan was a repeat winner. Uh, we'll probably get flack because it was also the most expensive, but and the uh, biggest. They did send it with the third row, which no one else had, and R line tram, so it was the most fun to drive. So a lot of it, did, you do pay more for it, but it has a lot of stuff that the others uh, don't. So uh, including an incredible warranty, six the, years, seven seventy thousand miles. Yeah, I guess the big takeaway is just these are all just barely different versions of the same exact vehicle, and the scoring was super tight. I mean, uh, it was just a matter of a point here, or there that you know could have dropped you. A spot or two. So. What was number two? Second place was the Subaru Forester. Um, always, a perennial favorite. Yeah, usually. always uh, super roomy inside, tons of visibility all around, easy to drive, one of the best all-wheel drive systems out there. Um, so that wasn't a big surprise. Third place was the Tucson. Um, you know, that could have went either way. You know, we would get flack for the most expensive one. We'd also get flack for the cheapest one, um, the Hyundai. It had a lot of features that um, – that the others had, but still the cheapest one in the test. Uh, interior probably is the big thing that held it back. Still lots of hard plastics and just very drab looking, whereas the others, uh, you know, were trying to spice things up inside. The uh, Tucson had the 2 liter? Correct. So it had the Theta? Uh, no, 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 not the term. 2.4 liter naturally aspirated. Engine. Is that the a Theta engine, the one that they're having some issues with, or is that just a 2 liter? I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember that either. Anyway, uh, Tucson has always been one of our favorites. So, all right, there's, there are a lot alike. Can you make a mistake in this class? Uh, no, I wouldn't think so. I mean, like I said, this is the biggest segment out there, and uh, everybody wants a piece of it, and uh, nobody's going to put out something. Yeah, no one's going to put out something that's going to disappoint anybody. So this is I the family so. runabout now. Yeah, it's, it's nice you know it's you know it's a fun. replacement. I bet 15 years ago, if you had told somebody that CRV and Rav Four wouldn't even be in the top three, then nobody would have believed you. Yeah, Crazy. I'm really. I'm still not 100 percent sure why Rav Four ended up finishing fifth. I'm still that's not brand new, and that's a pretty interesting vehicle. Yeah, I mean, it was our pick for the class. Yeah, and I guess maybe some of the things that we liked about it, just the fact that it was a little more rugged, at least looking, um, stuff like that, maybe didn't uh, work out too well with their specific scoring. Um, but, right, but again, you said it was close. Yeah. There's a whole rubric for this, and people vote on it. So it's not like they just sit in a room and say, well, this is my favorite. There's actually scores that get tabulated, and there's a bunch of numbers behind all this stuff. So it's not, just, it's not just we pick our favorite. It's, there's actually some science to it. And uh, maybe another takeaway, uh, Honda CRV finishing in fourth was actually the second cheapest. Uh, so that's that actually is pretty was interesting. a big surprise yeah. to me. Yeah, and it's the highest trim level that you can get. It wasn't like they sent a stripper. So, uh, 
the uh, that was kind of surprising. Usually they're at the top end of the things, but so. so the good news is that, and what we always tell folks is like, don't look for one source of information about a vehicle. Look at lots of different sources. Uh, this is a test that we do with the Cars dot com folks. Uh, we also have our own uh, estimation, our Driver's Choice Awards, but so do a lot of other people. But the takeaway that I got from your report on this was that they're all good. They're all worthy, and it's a matter of which one that you like the best, drives the best, feels the best for you. Whatever. Yeah, make sure, you know, if you're in the market, get out and try them all. Yeah. Very good. Thanks very much. Um, the 2020 Porsche 911 Carrera S Cabriolet. Ben, you had probably the most experience with it. Yes, sir. I just got back from Greece driving it. Of oh, course. too bad. This is the eighth generation 911, internally known as the 992. Um, and we recently got a chance to iron it out on the racetrack, the, the coupe version. This is the convertible version. And Greece's roads were a perfect tr- backdrop for this car. Um, although there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity to get out and really give it all I could because the roads were kind of tight and blind and unfamiliar. But <laughs> what a and you great, were safe. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. You don't want to be the guy to wreck yeah, a brand yeah. new Porsche. That too. But uh, – I give big kudos to Porsche because uh, part of the the magic is making the top look just as good up Mm -hmm. as the coupe, and and they keep continuing to nail it on the Cabriolet. Uh, It looks just as good with the top up. It's almost as quiet as the coupe with the top up. What about uh, structure? I mean, you've driven both now. Sure. Yeah, there's very – I mean, given the the driving that I could do in the cab – you, you're not going to really notice any uh, rigidity differences between the two, probably unless you get it out on the track. Mm-hmm. I also wasn't able to tell any difference between the uh, 4S and the regular S really? uh, on the roads that I had it on. Yeah. And there were times when we were getting pretty spirited, um, but not enough to to benefit from 4S, unfortunately. It was still a nice relaxing drive, and, and part of the takeaway is that um, – even at low speeds, it's fun to drive a super powerful, well built car around. And that's pretty much what this, these uh, Greek roads were. You know, it's getting to the point where a car like this uh, Carrera S uh, Cabriolet is, shall we say, mid price for Porsche. I mean, we used to look at this car you know, short yeah. of the turbo and think it was the top of the heap. They've got so many variants now. <laughs> they sure do. I mean, it. it it's, you know, it sounds like a lot of money. It looks like a lot of money on paper, but... 126000 bucks is it's, not exactly in my checkbook. No, me still. neither, but it's worth every penny if yeah. you did have the money for sure. And the colors that they have on this thing now are amazing. Mm. The Miami blue, stunning. I mean, of course, lizard green's a yeah. carryover, but there's a couple other colors that I had never seen before on a car, and they just looked amazing. They are an amazing car company. Yeah. I mean, they just keep slicing that onion. They've got thinner and thinner and keep just so many variants, and they're all... Worthy. I mean, they're just amazing cars. There were a couple of things that I didn't like about it, if mm-hmm. you care to hear. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the car is beautiful, but when you really get down to nitpicking it, the door handles don't seem to – they seem to have been designed by somebody else and just thrown on the car mm-hmm. as an afterthought because they look like they came right off of a AE86 Toyota <laughs> or a BRZ, whatever that thing's called now. <laughs> they just don't look quite right on it, and it bothered me for a little while. Um, and, the, of course, now you have a – you have a mechanical tack, and mm-hmm. the, scre- the your gauges to the left and right are configurable. They're all uh, digital screens now. And they look great, um, but the steering wheel—I don't know—it's either it's either a smaller diameter than usual, or the spokes are thicker. But some of it's blocked from directly behind the steering wheel. All you see is that tack, and maybe a little bit of mm. a corner of each other gauge. Is it a matter of seat height? No, we were all over the place, and even my driving partner was the same way. She, oh. she found it hard to see as well. Uh, I mean, it's nothing that can't be changed with a different wheel down the road. It just yeah. was on Porsche-like a little bit. And they do have optional wheels. I know that's one of, their, one of the areas they make money off of when they sell a car. Yeah, right? Custom- that's possible. Yeah. Customizable yeah. steering. All yeah. the cars on this trip had the same wheel. Isn't that interesting, though? That's where we are talking about that kind of car that we're talking about such uh, yeah, it's minor, tiny stuff like that. little things that uh, – well, thanks, Ben. Sounds like a, a, a terrific car and a terrific place to, uh, to try it out. Another 2020 Mercedes-Benz GLE 454 Matic. Uh, this is the successor to the ML, still made in uh, Alabama. Who would like to begin? 
Uh, it's all you, uh, Greg. Mid-size right. I'll SUV. I'll break, break my silence. Yes, yeah, so you, you've been very quiet today. Yeah, just one of those days, I guess. Uh, um, yeah, so I spent a eh, pretty good bit of time in it. Uh, start right away with the um, MBUX system, which is Mercedes-Benz User Experience. Good call. Very good. good. Fancy uh, name for infotainment. Yeah, infotainment. Uh, but this thing uses the dual screen that essentially looks like one screen working from the driver's gauges all the way over to the center screen. <clears throat> really beautiful, I think. Um, mo- uh, most important is the uh, voice assistant, which is really all the rage for people's homes and cars and everything now. Something that you can talk to, i.e. Alexa. The personal Siri. assistant. Right. Yeah. And um, I was... Probably the, this was the first comment I made about the car was how impressed I was with their personal assistant system. It picked up my voice every single time saying, hey, Mercedes. And it was I had the music all the way up and it heard me. Uh, occasionally it would get tripped up if you asked it things too quickly yeah, or just weren't quite that's what, clear. That was my experience. Either it was my I wasn't clear or if you tried to give it too many requests too close together it's like it had to digest one before it moved on but still when it did work it was pretty cool if yeah if you remember that this thing is not a human and can't quite hear things exactly the right way uh you know type it says hey mercedes take me to this place give me gas you can even ask it to define words for you and it does pretty well Uh, i thought that was cool another good thing about that system is the redundancy which sounds like a bad word but it really isn't when you you want to be able to do one thing in multiple ways whether it be talk to the system touch screen touch a knob the fact that you can do it in many different ways makes the whole system a lot more seamless so yeah i mean i'll I'll finish i'll stop talking about all the technology and talk about how it drives but that was really but cool. still that's a big deal yeah um comfortable car uh, the tra- nine-speed automatic transmission, Mercedes always seems to have their high-geared transmissions pretty well sorted out. No problems there. It has a straight-six engine, which is sounds great. Uh, the suspension was a little odd to me. It was, it was a comfortable, like, kind of a wavy experience until you hit, like, a, a pothole or an expansion joint, and it got super firm. It was just, like, almost disjointed in a way. that Like, you, it should be more comfortable. But it also had massive, like, 21-inch wheels. Oh, yeah. So the that could that probably enormous. played into that. But comfortable cruiser. Yeah, it's got the 48-volt electrical system in there. Um, that works with the engine and also with that suspension, as you mentioned. Plus, it's got the forward-facing camera, the camera that reads the road to predict. And it also even will use GPS information to... Uh, for the suspension to like pre select a setting uh, when it knows like there's a rough road coming up or you've got some twists and turns coming up. So, yeah, technology is a huge part of it. The uh, three liter turbo six you mentioned that comes standard with uh, formatic, still get a base. Uh, the base is now a two liter turbo, replacing the previous V6, and uh, that you can get in rear wheel drive or formatic. What about competitively with other vehicles in its class? Any have you drawn any conclusions? Because this is a another highly competitive uh, SUV class. I kind of did in our road test. I uh, just said that you know, as far as off road performance, it can't hang with a Range Rover, and as far as street performance, it can't hang with a Cayenne. But as far as comfort and technology, it's pretty much. Uh, up there, if not leader of the pack, certainly up there with the Q7. I think the Q7 is still pretty uh, mm-hmm. uh, tech savvy and comfortable, but uh, mm, I maybe would put it slightly above the Q7. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think just seeing a car like that, just listening to the way you guys describe it, just makes me so sad when I think of like comparing it to a Cadillac or like a Lincoln or something. I mean, the Mercedes just seems to be on a whole nother level sometimes in the luxury playing field with some of their vehicles. As far as pure luxury goes. The technology, and I mean, the interiors with that flowing screen from the gauge cluster to the infotainment and the lines, and just it's just amazing what they can do mm-hmm. in creating this entire experience that feels luxurious. And I know that sounds like a press release. I, didn't, I swear I didn't copy that, but, <laughs> no, but I think it just has a, an, an a vibe to it. That, that's this expansion of these screens now across the entire vehicle, which 
I'm not exactly sure who was first. Probably BMW, I think, actually was the first one to kind of stab at that. But now Mercedes is encompassing it with all their vehicles. And it does wrap around you. And it does look like those uh, concept cars where you would sit there and everything would be wrapped around you. We're actually getting very close to that. That's a good point. Yeah. For what it's worth, I think, and we've really all lauded uh, Audi's infotainment, mm-hmm. the way everything looks. This is probably the first system that I've thought this – is as good or maybe better than Audi's system. So I think that's saying something. That is saying something. And I, I think at least since buyers, especially people who buy this, maybe don't care so much about the driving characteristics, they're going to care about these other things. I think Mercedes knows that and, and delivers. I mean, they're still comfortable. They still care. Oh, yeah. It's still of, you know, a great vehicle to drive, but that's not the – I don't think that's what's going to be the deciding factor when somebody goes onto a lot and decides to write a $65,000 check for it. Mm-mm. So anybody else? You guys like the straight six Mercedes motor? I enjoyed it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I mean, the track. as far as yeah, street driving it, I liked it a lot. But um, I think little, I would have to take it to a track. Yeah, I, it just seems a little noisy to me at sometimes. Hmm. More noisy than almost like a diesel at, at times. More noisy than your typical six V six. Yeah, more noisy than you would think a Mercedes luxury uh-huh. truck would be. That's all. Yeah. I was just wondering if anybody else noticed it or if it was just me getting old or tinnitus or whatever <laughs> you don't think they're piping sound into the cabin are they uh, like they do in some of those other cars we no, drive i mean wind, I, I windows do. down and or if you're standing outside of it while it's running it seems just now that you seems said to be that, a little loud i do remember it having like a very distinct like diesel clattery almost sound like to a it. lifter noise like yeah. an old lifter noise <laughs> notice it at the track doing speed runs and stuff well there you go um We're going to move on to something that takes us back in time. Uh, Those of you that watch the show probably know that uh, Joe Ligo is the producer and originator of our muscle car memory segments where he looks back at often a a forgotten muscle car from back in the, uh, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, back when muscle and, and Detroit were synonymous. This time, Joe, you've got something very different. A, f- a, f- a flavor of a familiar car, but one you've probably never heard of. So we've all heard of the Buick Grand National. Of course. Everybody knows the blacked-out Darth Vader turbocharged terror of Two-door the 80s. Coops. Yes. But during its final year for that body style, the Buick Regal, Buick would allow drivers or uh, buyers to mix and match powertrains and trim levels in ways that they hadn't before, so it was possible to get a Regal Limited, which was the luxury Which trim. I actually used to own one. Yes. It was possible to get a Regal Limited, but for that year only, you could get it with the same <clears throat> powertrain and suspension as a Grand as National. A Grand National. And less, I think it was 1,035 of them were built, and they're, they're known by the collector crowd as Buick Regal Limited Turbo Tees. And so I, a guy contacted me after watching the show and said, I've got a great muscle car for you. It's a Buick Regal Limited Turbo T. I looked it up, and I realized, wow, this is something I've never heard of before. It's incredibly rare, and it's everything you'd love about a Grand National, but you know, it also is on, a little bit on the luxurious side. And I've, I had never driven the 3.8-liter turbocharged Buick mm-hmm. V6, but you read about them you know, from right. hearing this. It's this awesome engine, and it lived up to the hype. It was. It, was it quite, absolutely quite a, a motor. Its performance, I don't want to give away too much, but its performance still is viable today. Yes. <laughs> it was so much fun. Except to get out. that you had to do it in a straight line. Yes, yeah. That's, you definitely want to slow down before any curves come along because <laughs> this thing handles like a Buick. But, uh, no, it was an absolute blast to drive. You get out on a long straight road, you lay into it, and you see the digital boost gauge light up, and you hear the whoosh. Is the turbo spools? It's just an awesome, awesome experience. Now, does this car have the T tops? It does not have a T top okay. uh, ceiling, but it was it was so weird that final year. Buick would allow you to get anything. Yeah. You could get spoiler or no spoiler. You could get bench seat. You could get bucket seat. All kinds of customization that nowadays you know you You'd can't do on new that. cars. It's just well, the only one we have on the lot is black or silver. But back then, yeah, they you could get all kinds of crazy stuff and that's what makes this car so efficiency and it'll keep prices low right so lower so it was a lot of fun but like i said i don't want to give too much away so i think you just did (laughs) (laughs) it sounds like you had a good time with it i'm looking forward to yeah i'd I'd like to once again thank the owner jeff for letting me drive that just like i said that was a bucket list car so i'm glad i got to do it great 
All right, speaking of um, interesting things from the past, uh, we all know that uh, pickup trucks have long been the America's um, kind of passion, and now they've become even more so than ever. Uh, and with uh, This year alone, we've seen uh, new half tons from uh, all three major uh, domestic manufacturers. And lo and behold, the folks at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety have obviously been redirecting a lot of their focus uh, towards pickup trucks, and that's the basis of our lightning round. Uh, each person's going to get a chance to make 30 seconds worth of weighing in on our topic. It's actually going to take me longer than 30 seconds to read what the topic is, but here we go. IIHS recently crash-tested pickup trucks in their... Passenger side small overlap front test. This is where they're just hitting a barrier on the right side, the passenger side. Side. They found many of them did not do well. Only the Nissan Titan, Ford F-150, and Ram 1500 scored a good rating. The brand-new Chevrolet Silverado and GMC Sierra, along with the Colorado and Canyon, scored acceptable. That's one notch down as did the Toyota Tacoma and Honda Ridgeline. The Toyota Tundra, which has not been redesigned in a long time, got a poor rating, and basically the IIHS said they got a lot of work to do here. So... Expect to pay more for your next pickup truck. Do we think that pickup trucks, from our experiences, measure up to cars, given how expensive they are and how popular they are? Every person I know who buys a large truck or SUV, one of the reasons, one of many, is I just feel safer in it. They because say, feel of the sa- size. Right. They say, I just I want something that my family feels safe and that I feel safe. But sometimes the data doesn't always agree with how you feel. And I don't know if it's going to change sales of pickup trucks. I know the automakers will fall in line just so that they can get good ratings. But I think most of the buyers I personally know will ignore this. And I think say, this I is, like the truck too much. This is one of the last vestiges of designing vehicles to meet not only the rules but also the test. And that's what IIHS is out there doing now, I think, which is making sure that manufacturers give safety for everybody in the vehicle, not just to pass whatever tests they had. And they've gone through it with cars, and now they're focused because of popularity on trucks. There are – the thing that – I need to hush up because I've used more than my 30 seconds. You can't get over, though, the law of physics. Even if a truck against a barrier doesn't do as well as some people say it might, it still might do very well if against uh, a vehicle that's lighter than itself. Vice versa, someone in a compact car is not going to do well hitting a pickup truck no matter how well they it's rated. They the barrier test, so, in. I'll hush. Yeah, um, the passenger side barrier test, most often, though, that kind of collision would happen if you hit a tree or something. Yeah, or a telephone side pole or something. So, right. I mean, Correct. that's pretty close to a barrier. So, I, I think it's s- a very realistic test, yeah. actually. I can see where initially that maybe – there will be a small percentage of Chevy buyers that might try to shop something else a little safer because maybe they just had a kid and that can change mm-hmm. your whole perspective. But like Joe was saying, I think everybody's going to catch up pretty quick and it's going to be an even playing field before you know it. Uh, yeah, I don't think it would sway too many people because a lot of truck buyers are firmly Ford, firmly Chevy, firmly Ram. Uh, but anybody on the fence might see this and seeing the GM products who for the last year or two have been really saying our truck's better because we use high strength steel. The uh, F-150 uses all this aluminum. We're better. We're stronger. Yeah, how are they going to explain and now that now they're crash testing. Commercial. They're not crash testing as well as the aluminum trucks. So... Or uh, another steel truck, the uh, the Ram 1500. Uh, that's basically a steel truck, too. Yeah. And we've poo-pooed over the years sometimes the Ram for not having as sturdy a body or a frame as uh, some of the others. And so far in this test, anyway, it, that, didn't ha- that was not borne out. Uh, I would file this one under the no-brainer category. Uh, I mean, here's the thing. Chevy's not exactly building a truck to keep you safe. They're building and you hinted at it they're building a truck that'll pass the test and they didn't have this pass they didn't have this test when they were designing the new silverado so it didn't do it's no shocker it didn't do well in the test so 
now that IHS has determined this is a test that everyone needs to pass, I'm sure the next Silverado will pass it because they will design it to we pass the test. Cars. I should be. So. Let's be fair here. They actually were acceptable. It was the uh, Toyota Tundra that got the the poor rating. So the only truck that officially, if you can use, they don't use a pass fail, but obviously poor doesn't sound very good. And that was the Tundra, which hasn't been redesigned in what a decade? I don't know. Yeah, about time. yeah, yeah. So it was not that the, you know, basically the good news, I think, is that all but one truck were acceptable. However, uh, the Titan, the F-150, and the Ram 1500 rose above the crowd. And, Joe, do you remember uh, they had already tested the Ridgeline? The Ridgeline, of course, a you know, smaller truck, but it did very well. Yeah, the, the Ridgeline mm-hmm. and the so Tacoma acceptable. both scored acceptable. acceptable. Right. They were just acceptable. I was yes. thinking that that had done well. No, they okay, were Okay, so the only, the only three yeah. that actually knocked it out of the ballpark were Titan F-150 and Ram 150. That's correct. Okay. But acceptable still was... You know. Well, it's acceptable. Yes. So, you know, that's, that's what, the word, what the word means is probably pretty much what it says. They, they could do better. All right. Um, this is generally where we stop for a few minutes and talk about rants and raves. Um, before we uh, started recording today, we were all kind of talking about headlights. Joe, why don't you start that? Well, that's another we mentioned that was a big thing the IA, IIHS takes very seriously as of late is headlight testing. And multiple most people, vehicles fail in their test, right? And mul- multiple people at this table have noted that when driving at night in some of our test vehicles with the high beams off, we still get oncoming cars flashing their lights at us, assuming that they think that our high beams are on. And just the sort of frustration that comes, you're like, "No, my high beams aren't on. Why are you mad at me? I don't want the and other." Then you motors flash them back, which right. of course you, is not really good. Then you're like, "Oh, you really want to see my high beams?" <laughs> right. So I don't know what you're supposed you're to totally do. Lying, man. Yep. Sorry, yeah. I'm out of this conversation yeah. officially. Why? You were already in it. <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> but oh, I, so, so I pose this to you guys. Everybody, what, what everybody's are you got to do? this beef. We've all got this. Happens to all of us, I'm assuming. What do you do? I guess you ignore it. I just ignore it because I remember hearing those stories as a kid about the gang initiation yeah, things. So if you flash them oh back, then you're the target for <laughs> yeah. the gang initiation. Oh, and you're gonna no. follow you. I'm sure everybody that one I didn't know. <laughs> I think it's like one of those chain emails that like your aunt sends yeah. you. I think it's a uh, urban legend. Yeah, for sure. But last night coming up uh, 97, Interstate 97, we had – this is actually makes me angrier is the people that will be behind you in traffic with their high beams on. Oh, well, that's And they've just got no knowledge. They don't look at the, the IP. They don't see the little blue indicator light on. Well, you can't look at your IP and your phone at the same time. I guess time. that's exactly what was my feeling. Come on. Don't be ridiculous. And then what happened last night, and this is normal – Everybody that's right in front of them then tries to leapfrog further up the chain to get away from them. They don't pull over and drop back. Right. They go forward. So now you've got three lanes of traffic trying to get away from oh, the guy behind be. you who's tailgating with his brights on oh. and causing more potential problems. In the so. culprit's defense, in, the, <laughs> in, the uh-oh. Culprit's in newer defense. cars. <laughs> that uh, blue high beam indicator gets lost. Some of them don't more. even have it. Or at least cars. they have it. Like they, you said, you can't find they it. They hide it down they in the corner it. of yeah. the gauges yeah. where you yeah. can't see that, it. Well, that's another thing. Not every <laughs> car alerts you that your headlights are even on. And that's... Some, that's why wouldn't every single car make exactly. sure that you... That should be stand... That's the things that like I don't get about like, America sometimes. There's, like, there's the several things that should be standard. lately that we've gotten in that there's no indicator on the IP What's that the, the downside of, not have, of, of having it alert you that your headlights are on? Right. There are There is none. Then what about the people who flash their headlights to warn you there's a cop parked up up ahead? Or is that a whole thing? It seems to thing? happen less today these days. It does. I'm not sure most people even know what that means anymore. Right. Normally you're just like, why is this guy flashing his lights at me? And then you get pulled yeah. over for speed. <laughs> well, but, what do you got to do? Can't, can't say it doesn't serve him. But uh, the headlights, uh, everybody perceives that they're too bright because the light has changed to the bluish light of – um, LEDs, the and uh, LEDs, and the high intensity discharge, and I think that, and it has been shown that a blue light, bluish color, is more irritating in the eye than the yellowish that we've been used to with halogen. So that's probably uh, the basis for what's going on with a lot of this stuff. That's the wrap it up, John. 
<laughs> off to wear that's my right. sunglasses. That's right. better than Joe's uh, uh, bell, which he didn't bring into. Yeah, I'm either. sorry. I forgot. That's the all right. Bell. All right. I think we've uh, babbled on enough. This was Motor Week Podcast number 201. I want to thank everybody that participated today: Brian Robinson, Greg Carlos, Ben Davis, Joe Ligo. Thank you all, one and all. It was a lot of fun today, as usual is. For those of you out there that are listening to us by our podcast, we know you're fans of Motor Week. We want to thank you very, very much. Uh, you're catching us uh, on uh, our weekly show, hopefully on public TV stations near you. If you're wondering where you can see Motor Week, go to our uh, website, motorweek.org. Up in the right-hand corner, pull down the list, and you can put in your zip code or your city, and it will pull up an accurate listing of where you can see us, which is something we didn't have for a very long time. Or if you're a fan of the Motor Trend channel on your cable system, you can watch us there on Tuesday nights at 7.30 Eastern Time and a lot of other times during the week as well. For all of us at Motor Week, thanks very much for being a part of our family, and we'll talk to you next time on our next podcast. Until then, go out there and do one thing for us. Drive smart. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week. Television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station. 